Return to Life with Annie Elise starts right now. Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is Ten to Life where we talk all things true crime. If you're brand new stopping by for the first time, welcome. I hope you enjoy today's case video and the coverage. And if you do and you feel like this is a channel that you want to support and you want to come back and check out, make sure you hit that subscribe button below so that you get notified as I upload new videos and do live streams for ongoing cases as they're happening in real time. And for all of my returning subscribers, welcome back and thank you for your ongoing continued support. I'm so happy to have you guys here. So I'm coming to you guys today from my interim set. It's um, in it's in the works, but it's cozy nonetheless. I feel like I'm like sitting here. I have like my pillow right here in my lap, just feeling like I'm literally talking to you guys as friends because I look at you as friends. So it's kind of nice. I feel like you guys are here with me and we're just going to chat about some true crime here. So today we're going to be discussing an update in the case of the Ferreter couple from Jupiter, Florida, who has been charged with locking their 14-year-old adopted son inside an 8x8 room for over four years. Now, if you aren't familiar with this case and this is your first time hearing about it, that's okay. But I highly suggest that you go watch the previous video I did on it as it provides many more details. I'm going to link that video for you here and also in the description box below. In addition to the updates in this case that we'll be talking about today, I'm also going to share pictures with you guys of that room that they specially had built to hold their son captive. There's a lot to unpack and there's a lot to go over, guys, so we're going to go through all of it right now. But before we jump into the case, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Hey, guys. It's no secret that covering these cases and hearing about these cases takes a toll on all of us. And to be honest, with how much I'm exposed to in this line of work, it's important to me sometimes to take a break, but even more than that, to always take care of my mental health. And luckily, I found the perfect service to help me do that. Cerebral is an online mental health platform that provides access to prescription medication management, counseling, and therapy for anxiety, depression, insomnia, and many other conditions, all for a flat monthly rate. In addition to the resources I already mentioned, treatment is also available for ADHD, bipolar, and PTSD in certain states. Now, what I love about Cerebral is it offers the luxury of online convenience, but with complete privacy. I'm always on the go and my schedule changes from minute to minute. So what has been an absolute game changer for me is that you can meet with your therapist or counselor whenever it works best for your schedule and from the privacy of your own home. You're able to message your team at any time. So it's like you have your own little team right inside your pocket and it's fast. Usually you can meet in as little as 20 minutes. So you're able to be super flexible and not have your entire day mapped out ahead of you because all of us know sometimes when we feel like we need to talk, it happens in the moment and we can't always plan it out ahead of time. Your team at Cerebral works together to help create the best treatment plan for you. Your therapist, care counselor, and prescriber are all talking to each other, which normally doesn't happen in traditional settings, and it helps make sure everyone is aligned on what is best for you. To get that level of care and dedication, you would usually have to spend a fortune, but not with Cerebral. Cerebral is extremely affordable no matter your circumstances and whether or not you have insurance. It actually can cost three times less than traditional services, and they offer a consistent flat monthly monthly rate. To get started, all you have to do is fill out a short form online answering a few questions, and this helps Cerebral understand your symptoms. It's quick, it's easy, and effective. From there, you can choose to subscribe to one of three different membership options based on your needs and your budget. And if all of that isn't easy enough, Cerebral offers a convenient mobile app available on Google Play and the App Store, making it beyond easy to message your team like you have a full mental health care staff just on call right there in your pocket. And that really is so important, guys. It's 2022 and it's time for us to champion our mental health. So if you'd like to take the next step in working on your mental health, click the link in my description to start the questionnaire and get connected with a provider right away. Your first month starts at only $30, which is such a small 
price to pay when it comes to our mental health. So thank you Cerebral for helping me get my mental health in a place where I need it to be as I'm covering so many of these cases. And thank you so much for sponsoring today's video and helping offer this service to others. And thank you to all of you viewers for your support and for understanding that sponsors are essential to the channel if we want to grow it to a place where I can give you more true crime all the time. All right, let's get into today's case. Okay, guys, so as a quick summary in regards to this case, and again, go watch the previous video if you haven't yet, because there is just way more information where I read you guys the exact statements that the boy said, the claims made, I play interviews, and I just share way more details there. So go watch that if you haven't yet. But as a recap, Tracy and Tim Ferreter are a married couple who live in Jupiter, Florida. Jupiter is a very affluent and beautiful city that is picturesque and highly sought after. Tim and Tracy have four children, including a two-year-old boy, 13 and 16-year-old girls, and their 14-year-old adopted son, who they are accused of locking inside a small room for over four years, all while their other three children lived normally at the family's beautiful, spacious, $750,000 property, while their other son and, and these other kids' sibling, while he was fed scraps and forced to do yard work, and also even forced to write lines as a punishment for acting out. And some of these allegations of him acting out were things so minor and small, such as stealing cookies after being fed scraps and leftovers from whatever the family didn't finish for that meal. Now, not only were the conditions in which this boy was locked away absolutely horrible and completely inhumane, but what's worse is that the couple, his parents, are literally justifying it. When all of this unfolded and police discovered the room, they found that this 14-year-old boy was given an orange Home Depot bucket to use as a toilet. They saw that there was a ring doorbell cam mounted to the ceiling to monitor his every move. And they also saw that the locks and the light switch were on the outside of the room, not allowing him to control getting in or out of the room on his own or even to turn the light on in his room, essentially trapping him inside a dark, small box. Once the detectives interviewed the boy, he also made horrific allegations that in addition to being locked away, his father physically injured him repeatedly. Again, things that this couple is actually justifying. Now, what's really interesting is the accused couple, both 46 years old, told the police that this makeshift cage was a home office, despite it having no windows, no door handle on the inside, but instead a deadbolt and the only light switch located on the outside. But it was also, remember, fitted for a ring doorbell camera so they could monitor him day and night as he slept, as he ate, and ultimately as he spent up to 18 hours a day locked inside this room, only allowing him to leave to attend school. The couple were first reported to authorities on December 28th last year by a builder, and this builder's name is Jack Ben Aim, and he was paid essentially by this couple $3,000 and given just two days to build what he calls a very strange office inside their garage. The handyman was told that this freestanding structure would not require a window and should only have a lock on the outside of the door. In fact, the husband called this handyman and said that he wanted it to be an 8x8 room with no windows and drilling and to drill a hole in the ceiling so that they could run that video camera cord to watch this every move. And the handyman is now speaking out. Take a look. This is from the incident report involving a call from a handyman. The complainant on the call, only identified as Jack, advised he was contacted by the owner of blank in the blank to build an office in the garage of the residence. Jack advised he agreed to do the job, but after receiving the instructions for the build, he began thinking it was very strange. Jack advised the room was built as an eight foot by eight foot space in the garage with its own ceiling and own door. Jack further advised the door had a deadbolt lock and the knob only on the outside. No knob 
inside. So if someone were inside the office, they would not be able to exit unless someone opened the door for them on the outside. Jack stated he was also instructed to build this space with electricity and install a window air conditioning unit as well as a camera in the ceiling and stated the entire project was to be completed within two days. And he's saying he said it should have its own ceiling, so it was sealed completely. That meant that it was like a cage. But I said, okay, you know, it's his money. What do I care? What, do I, what should I do? What do I care if he doesn't want a window? But then he says that on the last day, Tim asked him to fit a lock, but that he wanted it reversed so that the knob was on the outside. And he says that's what set off the red lights for him. He says, I could not think of a single reason to reverse the lock, except for one, to lock somebody in from the outside. The handyman immediately felt like something was off and contacted the authorities. But unfortunately, nothing materialized because although it was suspicious, there was still no evidence of a crime. And now we're getting a look at that room that was built and where these monsters were locking away their 14-year-old adopted son. Here you can see where the makeshift room really begins to take form and how small it truly is. Also, how it is detached from the rest of the house in the garage as to truly isolate this young boy. We also see photos where they drilled that hole to run the camera cord feed so they could watch his every move. Now guys, let me just ask you this. If this weren't their first time doing this to him, and this weren't the first house that they had ever locked him up in, which it wasn't, and we're going to get to that in just a minute, they clearly had practice with this. Not only enough practice, but now they are spending money to completely build a custom room for them to execute this horrible crime and to just lock him away. So if you're going to go to the lengths of spending thousands of dollars to custom build this room, why not at least include a toilet at the very minimum, unless you are purposefully and willfully trying to torture and break down this young boy. You had the opportunity to build this however you chose to, and you chose to specify to the handyman, no windows, no bathroom, no door handle, giving you complete control. It is just beyond evil. Now, if I go back to my comment about them having done this before and having practice with this horrible crime, detectives suspect that Tim and his wife, Tracy, could have been locking up their son since as long ago as 2017. And they believe this because they found evidence of similar cell-like rooms existing at their previous homes. Previous homes, multiple. Before they moved to Jupiter in November of 2021 last year, the family lived on a ranch in Tucson, Arizona, and that current owner said he saw a strange box structure in the garage when he first toured the property, saying that it was torn down before he moved in and he never reported it to police because he had no reason to. He had no reason to doubt the couple or to think that they would have used this room for anything sinister. And truthfully, nobody had any reason to doubt them. Their social media pages are filled with wholesome pictures of vacations, family meals, family outings, and Tim himself has a work history of employment at multiple Fortune 500 companies, which this just goes to show, guys, that evil really can be in disguise anywhere by anyone. So prior to that ranch house in Arizona, the couple lived at a different house in Jupiter from 2014 to 2017. And this house, when it was sold, was advertised as having a bonus room in its garage when they sold it. However, the current owner and the person who had bought it from them at the time said that he had that extra bonus room removed because the room could only be locked from the outside. And he believed that the room was made to keep someone inside of it. And when he was shown the inside of that room, when he toured the property before buying it, he says that it had a small child-sized bed inside with a comforter. Not necessarily how you would describe or classify a bonus room. Usually bonus rooms have, you know, a pool table, a TV, a couch, sometimes a bar in some big bonus rooms, not a child-sized bed and a comforter, and certainly not a lock from the outside. This was something that they were not intending to, to quit doing, 
this is a lifestyle for this adopted child. And what concerns me is they're saying, oh, making excuses that maybe this child had attachment disorder. Well, well, no kidding. You're not having any bond with this kid because you're keeping him in isolation. Now, as for their reasoning and their justification, the couple's attorney, Nellie King, presented documents in court suggesting that their son suffered from a condition called RAD. This condition makes it hard for children to form a healthy bond with their caretaker, and RAD is a disorder that allegedly made their son very violent and very dangerous. And they say that they were doing this and locking him up for his own protection, as well as for the protection of their other children and the protection of the public. It's about reactive attachment disorder and your thoughts about the life that this mm -hmm. child has been subjected to. Well, reactive attachment disorder is where a child uh, does not have um, loving parents or loving caretakers to attach to in the first place. Now, we know that he was adopted, but we don't know um, at this point or they're not telling, you know, what his life was like from his, with his parents or his mother, um, who he came from originally. I mean, that's really he was just he was. Um, he had problems before he came to live with this family. And um, that needs to be investigated. But, um, you know, people, kids get re at reactive attachment disorder because when they don't have a stable, loving uh, set of parents or a parent um, to develop this loving bond with, or if they get changed around from home to home, then they get afraid of loving whatever parents are with, like let's say this adoptive couple, they're afra he's afraid of forming a loving attachment with them because of what he has had before that. Now, that's not an excuse for the horrendous treatment that they're giving him. Clearly, if they adopted him and they started seeing some of these behaviors and some of the behaviors that reactive um, uh, attachment children have are they're very volatile, they can be violent, um, they're irritable, uh, they're afraid, they're very fearful, they're afraid to be touched, lots of very difficult behaviors. But when they saw that at the beginning, they should have brought him for treatment. Um, you know, at this point, it seems like he should be in a psychiatric hospital for a long period of treatment before he can come out and be with any family where it's safe. There is a million different options and different ways to handle this before this drastic one. Not to mention, this was ongoing for years. We also have yet to see any official reports or claims made in the past outlining this suggested disorder or unruly dangerous behavior. Their attorney also claimed in a statement that investigators ignored critical evidence from Arizona that will ultimately vindicate this couple. Now, I'm very eager to see what this evidence is that is going to somehow vindicate them. Because truthfully, I don't know how they will ever at all be vindicated for this. Timothy and Tracy were released on $50,000 bond, but ultimately all four of their kids were removed by CPS. They're due back in court on March 10th, so in just a couple of days, so sh we should have an update very, very soon. If you want to stay informed on those updates, make sure you're subscribed if you haven't done so already. By the way, it's totally free. It's not going to cost you a thing. But what do you guys think about this case? Is there anything in the world that could make this treatment and behavior justified? Because also remember, in addition to being locked away, this 14-year-old also reported that he was physically and emotionally hurt repeatedly by his father, which is the complete polar opposite of their story that he's the abuser. And again, I have all of those details as far as the specific claims, which guys, they're really, really bad and it's, it's not easy to listen to, but I have all of those details in my other video, which again, you can watch here or in the description box below. I'll link it. So let me know what you guys think. I'm eager to hear your thoughts. I want to know if you think that this is justified, which even so, let me just say this. Even if they bring all of the documents in the world showing that there are previous medical diagnoses, that they had made police reports, that they were in fear of their son, if they bring all of those to court, does that mean that they aren't held accountable for this and they get to just walk and skate through this as though they did nothing wrong? Because that doesn't seem right either. And if those reports exist... Wouldn't it have made more sense, and I'm not an expert here, but wouldn't it have made more sense that they put him into 
inpatient treatment or into a facility of some sort. Not, I can't imagine any doctor would ever advise them to lock him up. And to do this at three different properties over the course of four to five years, then not not to be held accountable, which we don't know if they will be or not, but if they bring this documentation forward that they're alleging they have, if they aren't held accountable, does this just give permission for a ton of different evil parents out there to use this excuse? Or if they do have a child who has this disorder, God forbid, to now, you know, escalate and lock them away rather than seeking help? I don't know. It, there's some, I just... I, I'm interested to know how this is going to play out. And I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are, guys. So please leave them in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in with me. And let's keep the conversation going. If you want to stay updated again, make sure you hit subscribe. Thanks for hanging with me on my couch and just talking true crime with me. And I'll talk with you guys again very soon. So until the next case, stay safe. Bye.